Do you ever get church bored? Do you ever get bored with church uh, prayer or maybe some other kind of spiritual practice or discipline? I mean, I, I know I'm a pastor and, uh, and all, and I'm not supposed to be bored with these sorts of spiritual things, but I mean, I have to admit that sometimes I do get just a little bored, and sometimes I get a lot bored with, some, with, uh, with church things from time to time. And, and I remember those days back in uh, you know, 1993 when I first became a Christian, and I had a very kind of powerful uh, spiritual experience of, of being uh, born again. And, you know, those, those days, uh, shortly after I uh, became a Christian, uh, first became a Christian, were, were very much full of joy and, and everything was kind of new and exciting. And it was a lot like, I think, being fitted for new glasses for the first time, right? Um, before you have glasses... Uh, you don't kind of realize that what you're seeing is kind of a blurry representation of what really is. Uh, but when you do slip those glasses on your face for the first time, uh, for me it was in high school, uh, everything was just so clear and uh, amazing. You could make out details on the trees, you could see individual leaves and things, you could make out details on, on buildings and things that you just never knew were there before. It just was so world-changing in a lot of ways. And, and, a, and a new spiritual experience can be a lot like that, right? It can be exciting, it can be thrilling, but something changes a little later on for... Well, for all of us, actually, something changes. Now, I'm not sure what it was for me, or I'm not exactly sure when it happened, um, but at some point in my Christian life, fairly early on, I, I took my first nap during a sermon, you know. <laughs> it happens, right? It happens to all of us. But at the time, you know, I was like, oh, wow, what is going on? Where is all the excitement, right? Where is all the, all, all the energy that I once had? I mean, I, I have a personal relationship with the king of kings now, the, the savior of the world, and here I was, losing some interest in church, finding prayer to be a bit dull from time to time having trouble keeping my focus while I was reading the Bible, right? You all know what that's like. Sometimes I was just plain bored with it all. But I'm probably the only one who, who's like that, right? I'm probably, right? I mean, raise your hand if you think I'm the only one who's like that. Yeah, see, there we go. I knew it. I knew it. Why don't you get up here and preach a sermon in <laughs> uh, and, and, and that happens. Sometimes the fire just kind of dies down a bit. When I lived in Springfield before I got married, uh, two apartment buildings over the time that I lived there for just a couple of years, two apartment buildings within view of my home <laughs> caught fire within like several weeks of each other. It was really strange. And the, but the first fire, I'll never forget, I was sitting at the computer uh, in my bedroom when I, when I heard this loud pop outside the window, and, and I looked over at the apartment across the street, and one of the second-story windows up there was, was missing, and flames were just, were just jutting out. It was just surreal. It was like I was in some sort of uh, movie all of a sudden. And so I jumped up and I called the fire department and then went downstairs and outside. And by the time I got there, uh, everybody had safely evacuated from the apartment building and everybody was fine. And, and so all of us neighbors just kind of stood around and, you know, watched the fire like you do and, uh, and uh, watched the firefighters as they battled the blaze. And, and a sizable crowd gathered around, as they do, right, to watch a fire, because that's pretty interesting stuff, right? It's, it's kind of exciting uh, to see. It's not something that you see every day. The firefighters managed to contain the blaze to just that one apartment in the building, and so that was great. And, 
And then something happened that happens at the end of every house fire. When the fire is finally put out, the crowd that gathered around to see it, what happens? They go home, right? There's nothing more to see here. People will gather where there is a fire. It's very interesting. But once the fire is gone, no one sticks around to watch the smoldering ashes. And I wonder if you'll just kind of do a a little check with yourself this morning. Just a mental, spiritual check. Do you ever feel like the fire is out or going out? That there's not much reason to hang around any longer. We get that way sometimes, don't we? I mean, the fire was nice while it lasted, but hey, you know, the ball game's on. You know, they're starting out the XFL now, so we got to watch the new football league that's starting up, and so I'm heading home. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a new believer, whether you've been a follower of Jesus for a long time, or anywhere in between. There are times when you just aren't going to feel like you have much energy to follow Jesus. It's okay to admit that. It's okay to be honest with ourselves and with each other about that. So what what is it for you? Are you falling asleep during prayer time? Do you have trouble keeping focus when you're reading the Bible, right? Your eyes just kind of scan over the same sentence six or seven times because you just just can't remember what you read. Maybe you just don't want to go to church anymore. The songs don't particularly move you or the sermon isn't very rousing or applicable. We're talking about other churches. Those, Those other guys. We're not talking... Present company excluded, as the kids say. It could be that you really can't find the energy or the interest in serving others through the church's ministries. Or maybe it's not boredom at all. Maybe you're just plain tired, right? Maybe it's fatigue. The journey of following Jesus can get long. It can get long. And sometimes when the view doesn't change for a while, it can get tiring. These are very common and understandable experiences. And and I certainly am not here this morning to berate you and, 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 and to be down on you because of that. Because it is, I believe, a normal part of our Christian life together. But... It is something that we have to be aware of because this kind of fatigue, this kind of boredom can create a kind of spiritual slothfulness. So, to paraphrase the righteous brothers, what do you do when you've lost that love and feeling? Right. <laughs> I know you want me to sing it, but I'm not going to. <laughs> The good news is that we are not the first group to deal with boredom or fatigue with the spiritual life, right? This isn't something that is is a 21st century dilemma, honestly. Consider Jesus' disciples, right? I mean, if anybody should be constantly psyched up about following Jesus and constantly on fire for the Lord and just ready to run around, you know, like, like cats on catnip, you know, going from place to place, it would have been the disciples, you would think, right? Because there they are, they're walking with Jesus in the flesh, right? But surely they, right, must have been the most engaged, the most enthusiastic, the most eager of all Christians that ever were. But actually, not so much, it turns out. Not so much. Even they had their times of spiritual slothfulness. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9, verse 28, which is also in the back of the bulletin. But don't be lazy. Get your Bibles out, right? I mean, in, a, in, in, in all the sermons uh, to get your Bible out, right? 
This is one of them, right? Don't be lazy. Come on. Turn the pages. That's right. That's right. Let's start at verse, chapter 9, verse, um, verse 28. As the story goes, Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up the mountain to pray. Now, Jesus is taking Peter, John, and James with him up the mountain to pray. And he's taking these three, uh, uh, but not the rest of the disciples. And, and why is that? Well, there were different groups of followers in Jesus' day that Luke identifies in his Gospels. There were the larger crowd of people who were in need, who were seeking healing from Jesus. There were people who identified themselves as disciples. They were kind of students or followers. And then there were the 12 men. There were 12 men, a a smaller circle, who Jesus selected as apostles, those who were uh, sent and called uh, to exercise special uh, authority. But even within these 12 apostles, there were these three men, Peter, James, and John, who were especially close to Jesus and actually who turned out to be very important leaders in uh, the early church following Jesus' death and resurrection. They were the three men, Peter, James, and John, who left that miraculous catch of fish back at the Sea of Galilee when Jesus first called them to follow. And they are the three who are now going up the mountain to pray with Jesus, right? A a very special honor uh, to be asked to do that. And so we continue the story in verse 29, and while Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Now, here's where our imaginations will kind of have to come into play, right? Because this is something that is just not, not normal, right? This is not, not normal. Uh, and so we're going to have to kind of use our imaginations to comprehend what's going on here. You see, three of the four gospel writers include this event in their gospels. And each one describes this change in Jesus' appearance a little differently. Each one struggles also to kind of come up with the right words to explain what happened. In in one it says, in one gospel it says, his clothes became bright as a flash of lightning. Right? Now we've all seen lightning before, right? I've seen lightning strike the street outside my house when I was a kid, and it left a pretty good sized hole in the street uh, to boot. Now, imagine a lightning strike, okay? Imagine the, the, the blinding flash of that, but that the lightning strike doesn't go away. It, it stays there, and it continues to radiate that intense, white-hot light, right? I mean, that was the only way that Luke and the other Gospels kind of knew how to describe it. Matthew's gospel tells us that Jesus' face shone like the sun. That is all pretty exciting stuff, right? Lightning, faces shining like the sun. I mean, it's all pretty intense stuff. I mean, if you can't stay awake during that, I mean, I don't blame you for sleeping during a sermon, right? But if you can't stay awake during that, man, you need to check your pulse, okay? Okay? And so we continue on in verse 30 and 31. Suddenly, Peter, James, and John saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. This is even more amazing, right? Not only is Jesus' face shining like the sun, and his clothing is is as white as as a flash of lightning that doesn't go away, right? And now there's two other guys up here, Moses and Elijah. Moses, the giver of the law to the Jews, and Elijah, one of the most venerated Jewish prophets. And these two men appear in Glorious splendor, 
whatever that is, right? But it sounds pretty, pretty neat. Sounds pretty cool. And they're talking with Jesus about his mission. I mean, imagine you're watching all this. They're talking with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. What are they talking about? Do you ever stop to think about what they're talking about? Or are you too lazy just to kind of think too, you know, more deeply about, about what it is? Are they encouraging to finish the race? Are they giving him some final instructions on his last days? Are they reminding him about the importance of, of the mission that God has given him? Are, are they merely symbols to represent the Jewish Old Testament and the fulfillment of the law and the prophets? Think about it. Use your imagination. What are you watching them talk about? Well, what do Peter, James, and John think about all this? Well, first we're going to have to wake them up to ask them, right? That's right. Peter and James and John, oh, they're getting sleepy, right? <laughs> they need a nap for some reason. Verse 32, now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. They were sleepy. Can you imagine being sleepy during when all this is happening? But since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory in the two men who stood with them. Well, this wouldn't actually be the first time that Peter, James, and John fell asleep while something important was happening around them, right? In Mark 14, there is this crazy, this is an interesting story. It's, it's, a, it's kind of funny in a way, right? The, the, the story of the night of Jesus' arrest. Jesus asks Peter, James, and John again, right? This time to pray with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the night he's going to be arrested and then shortly thereafter crucified, right? So Jesus is, you know, concerned, right? <laughs> so he asks these three guys to pray with him. And so Jesus goes off a little ways to pray by himself and they're kind of nearby and and he comes back after praying, and we read in Mark 14, verse 37, Jesus came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Boy, an hour is a long time to pray, Jesus. I don't know. I mean, that's asking a lot of us, right? <laughs> so Jesus goes back to pray some more, right? And then we read in verse 40, in verse 39 and 40, and once more, Jesus came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him, right? Because honestly, when the Lord comes and finds you sleeping when you should be pray, praying, you know, it's going to be kind of tough to excuse that kind of behavior, isn't it? It's just best to keep your mouth closed, I guess. And then, and then what happens? He came to them a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest enough? The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Wow. Three times. That's, that's a tough one to live down. Who else besides me, though, finds some small amount of comfort in knowing we're not the only ones who have some trouble staying awake when we should be praying, right? It is a little bit comforting knowing that Jesus' three best friends had trouble with that too. Well, Peter, James, and John do finally get themselves alert enough to realize that there are now six people on the mountain when there were only four just a moment ago. But Moses and Elijah are starting to leave. So Peter perks up and, and he says in verse 33, he says, Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Because when you're groggy and you're waking up from a nap, right, you can kind of say weird things, right? <laughs> Well, Peter wanted this relationship, this, this experience rather, to last. Before, when it was just the, the four of them, he could hardly keep his eyes open. But now, he wants to build tents for 
Jesus, Moses, and Elijah to make this experience last as long as he can. The fire was going out, and Peter didn't want to go home yet. He didn't want to go back to the daily grind. And I think that's what we often do when we have a so-called mountaintop spiritual experience. We, we want to hang out there. We, we want to never leave. But the problem is that those experiences don't last forever. A, a lot of us remember the, the golden days, right? The good old days when church was this way and preachers were that way and when we, you know, we, we did things this way and we had lots of, lots of people, right? But those are fleeting moments. Sometimes we try and artificially recreate them and then get frustrated because ultimately they never are going to amount to what we had before. We can get frustrated and so frustrated that we give up and then we can get very, very bored. So how do we keep from falling asleep on the mountain? like Peter, James, and John. Well, I think the experience of these three closest friends of Jesus can give us some clues on how to keep that house fire going within us. And the first thing is, don't try to bottle up those past mountaintop experiences. Don't try to recreate them. Don't try to wistfully think about how things used to be. Take them for what they were and be thankful for them, right? But know that they were meant for a specific time and a specific place. The plain truth is is that life is simply boring much of the time. It is. Raising kids, paying the mortgage, routine medical checkups, mowing the lawn, shoveling the snow, right? It's just kind of life can be ordinary. Don't confuse being bored with lack of entertainment. The second thing I think we could do is to listen more often. Listen more often. In verse 34 and 35 of our text, it reads, While he was saying this, Peter meaning, Uh, A cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my Son, my Chosen. Listen to Him. Listen to Him. The voice of God that came from the cloud that enveloped these three terrified disciples had one message. This is my Son, the one I have chosen Listen to Him. Are we taking the time to listen? Are we being quiet and still enough so that we can hear what Jesus is saying to us and to our church? The third thing I think we could do is that we can be more bold and take more chances. Stop waiting around for things to happen to us so that we can get excited, so that we can be uh, um, uh, more energized to follow Jesus. That, that is the problem, I think, sometimes with professionalizing Christian ministry, right? Is, is that we expect the professionals to get us raring to go, rather than, and, 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 and by doing so, we kind of release ourselves from that responsibility. Be bold. Take chances. I mean, Peter didn't really know what he was saying when he groggily asked Jesus to let him build these shelters, but I admire him for his brashness, right? I mean, sometimes you got to go out on a limb. Sometimes you just got to try. And sometimes when you go out on a limb, you fall back down to earth. But that's okay. It's better to try and get out of that rut and fail and try again than to stay in that rut for the rest of your life. A lot of you have tried to do things to re-energize your spiritual life. A lot of you have tried to do, let's say, read the Bible through in a year or 
pray more consistently or engage in another spiritual discipline. And you failed. I have failed many a time, right? But it's better to fail and then get back up and start again than it is to just say, well, I just can't do it. Uh, I'm, just a, I'm just no good. There's, there's no way I'm, I'm going to be able to, to, to stop being you know, a, a, a lazy Christian. Right? That's a worse condition than it is to start something and fail and start again. Right? So for those of you who have been trying to Rev up your spiritual life. Let me just encourage you to say, try again, friend, okay? Do it again. And know that failure, know that getting tired and getting bored with it is part of the experience. But don't let that have the last word. Keep going. Try again, right? Jesus will meet you there. He will meet you there. He has promised to do so. So find out, find out what inspires you. What gets you going? What interests you? Right? I mean, learn what really makes you excited and alive. Where are you when you feel most interested, when, you're, when your brain feels most kind of uh, aware of what's going on around you, when you feel most uh, excited and, and interested? One friend from seminary told me that she feels most alive when she's running. I mean, that's when I feel most close to death, but she feels most <laughs> close to being alive. Running, jogging, you know, going out. For, that's great. That's great. You do you, boo. You do you. I'm not going to, you know. What is it for you, right? Maybe, uh, you know, she, she says her mind gets, you know, gets clear when she's running and she could kind of really, uh, really, really pray during those times. Becky has a friend uh, who says that she felt most... Uh, most uh, spiritually alive when she's in caves. You know, something about being in those enclosed places underground and just, just felt, she just felt kind of surrounded by God's presence in those places. Um, I know that for me, when, when I'm particularly bored uh, and can't seem to, you know, have enough energy to write a sermon, I'll, I'll listen to some of my favorite music and and that kind of wakes me up and reminds me why I'm doing this. Getting out into, uh, the, uh, you know, beneath a canopy of trees is a special place uh, for me. So ask yourself, when or where are you when you feel most alive? And when you're bored and when you've got that spiritual fatigue, you need to go to those places. You need to do those things and practice the presence of God there okay and don't think that well you know it's not a very spiritual kind of thing that makes me feel alive it doesn't have to be i mean really everything is spiritual because you carry god's spirit with you wherever you go author and pastor frederick beekner once wrote He said, boredom ought to be one of the seven deadly sins. It deserves the honor. You can be bored by virtually anything if you put your mind to it or choose not to. You can yawn your way through Don Giovanni or a trip to the Grand Canyon or an afternoon with your dearest friend or a sunset. There are doubtless those who nodded off at the coronation of Napoleon or the trial of Joan of Arc, or when Shakespeare appeared at the Globe in Hamlet, or when Lincoln delivered himself of a few remarks at Gettysburg. The odds are that the Sermon on the Mount had more than a few of the congregation twitchy and glassy-eyed. To be bored is to turn down cold whatever life happens to be offering you at the moment. It is to cast a jaundiced eye at life in general, including, most of all, 
of your own life. You feel nothing is worth getting excited about because you yourself are not worth getting excited about. To be bored is a way of making the least of things you, you often have a sneaking suspicion you need the most. We don't find passion for following Jesus for the sake of simply being excited or entertained. Our goal in life is not to avoid boredom. That's just going to happen. Our goal is to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And one of the things that boredom does is it gets us focused on ourselves instead of Jesus. Imagine, if you will, what our lives would be like if we really grasped the love of God. What if you could fully comprehend the great and lasting joy that God has for you and for all people? Would you even be able to contain your enthusiasm? You say, but we cannot fully grasp the love of God. And I think that's the answer to boredom. The answer is what is to stop us from trying. 